Uh, honorable Speaker, uh, uh, His Excellency, Dr. William Samway Ruto, uh, all protocol observed. I want to be extremely brief. As you know, I am not used to making long speeches. So allow me to go through some written remarks here. Yeah. Uh, it is my it's a pleasure to join and speak to you at this important forum that is now a tradition in Kenya. I will begin by paraphrasing the words of the 32nd U.S. President, Franklin Roosevelt, uttered in March 1933. The times require that we address each other with candor and the decisiveness that the present situation of our nation demands. This is the time, honorable colleague members, uh, to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. And we must not shy from honestly facing the conditions in our country today. Article 95, sub-article 2 of the Constitution mandates the National Assembly to deliberate and resolve issues of concern to the people. We meet at a difficult time for our country and our people. These are not normal times and we must not settle for business as usual. When we come together as we do today, Kenyans hope we might come up with solutions to the many problems they are grappling with and the many doubts they harbor about the country's future. Majority of us here are elected representatives of the people. The people are our business and we know they are suffering. From escalating food prices to escalating costs of secondary education, to rising costs of electricity, and so on and so forth, to lingering questions about the just concluded general elections. Kenyans have concerns, doubts, and fears that we must respond to. And Kenyans feel that we, sometimes, Kenyans feel that we have tended to abandon them and be cozy. To the, with the executive. At this forum, and back in Nairobi, we must agree on how to work for the people and not for ourselves or the executive. And, and this is apparent, really, from the hue and, cru, hue and cry about uh, the very, very serious matter of NGCDF. You know, the suffering in our countryside is manifest. Uh, and this comes out clear when you come to the realization that most Kenyans have come to view a fund such as NGCDF as their lifeline. And in, indeed, if I don't speak about NGCDF, perhaps no one else will speak about it. Uh, that's a fund that... Nitoboy, uh, uh, Nitoboy. The NGCDF is a fund that and GAF, of course, is a fund that must be ring-fenced, if only to save our people. And anybody, or any authority that would, would tend to interfere with NGCDF will definitely meet the wrath of the people. The Constitution of Kenya 2010 enhanced our power in the approval and oversight of the budget. That is one of the subjects we are set to discuss here in this seminar. I want to appeal to all of us, regardless of our parties, to ask, uh, to ask ourselves to what extent can we support taxation policies that are clearly hurting our people. Don't we have powers to lessen the tax burden in our country? If the answer is yes, the next, the next question is, why aren't we using that power 
Again, why can't we ensure that the national budgeting is realistic and based on solid assumptions, including realistic revenue projections? And I say this with all humility, with all humility. And uh, the Honorable Nindi Nyoro and my good friend, Honorable Kimani Kuria, who are chairs of budget committee and finance committee, respectively, were members of the public accounts committee in the 12th parliament, which I was privileged to chair. And I've got no doubt about their capacity to lead those very two key committees. We must, as a country, cut our cloth according to our size. We have to do that. This budget that we keep on talking about, about three trillion, three trillion, in the last, in the financial year 2019-2020, which is the last financial year we reported on as PSC, the total national revenue collection was about 1.7 trillion shillings. In a budget of three trillion shillings. That obviously leaves you with a gap, a budget deficit of 1.3 trillion shillings or thereabout. Anybody in basic economics class will tell you that is not sustainable. And this, this house must do something about it. This house must do something about it. When our people say they can't afford basics like UNGA and so, and, and so forth, don't we have the power, responsibility, and mandate to force the executive to act on those complaints? Are we that powerless to be sent by the people to speak and act for them only for us to do nothing? The last time in recent history that parliament convened while dark clouds of uncertainty, doubts and hunger hovered over the land was in the year 2018, in the midst of the post-election violence. That parliament that opened on the 15th of January 2008 went down in history as the one that came up with a raft of decisive steps that restored hope among our people. As I said, the economy strengthened existing institutions and created new ones to improve governance. That parliament laid ground for judicial reforms, police reforms, constitutional reforms, electoral reforms, truth, justice and reconciliation, land reforms, and youth employment, among other progressive initiatives. Above all, the 10th parliament gave the country a new constitution. What do we, the 13th parliament, want to be remembered for, having come to office in times very similar to those of 2008? Do we want to be remembered as the assembly that saw suffering of the people and did nothing? Today, we have a situation, and I'm just concluding now. We have a situation where parliament is being asked to originate legislation creating the office of the leader of opposition and allowing cabinet secretaries to attend house proceedings and answer questions from honorable members. Are we sure we want to be the assembly that could not take a stand whether we are a presidential or a parliamentary system? Can't we make up our minds for once? Because really, there seems to be consensus on some of these issues. Everybody seems to be agreeing that we need the office of leader of official opposition. Everybody seems to be agreeing that we need the cabinet secretaries to be in the house. Okay? Then why can't we just go the full hog and say we want parliamentary system and have cabinet ministers appointed among, for amongst us? Why are we going for half measures? Why? Why? And if we want the office of the leader of official opposition, and we also seem to want the office of the prime minister, both political formations, the major ones, this for now, we all agree that we need the office of the prime minister. 
Then why can't we go the full hog and review the constitution and create that office as the head of government business in the National Assembly? Okay? I am very impressed that the doctrine of separation of powers features prominently in the seminar program. Our nation's political landscape demands constant engagement on the issue. The spirit, of in, the spirit inherent in this doctrine is to entrench division of government responsibilities between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, to inhibit concentration of power and provide for checks and balances. This is key to the proper functioning of democratic system of governance. Indeed, the Constitution clearly assigns specific roles to the different arms of government. However, in the execution of the roles, none of the arms can operate in isolation. It behoves the 13th Parliament to assert its independence while maintaining good working relations with the other arms of government. Strangulation of the judiciary and parliament by the executive is inimical to the democratic culture that we are trying to cultivate in the country under the new constitutional dispensation. We cannot end this seminar very finally, without addressing the issue of IBC. Today, just like in the election of 2007, I know I may be touching a run up, but if we're leaders, need to talk. Today, just, uh, just like in the election of 2007, the integrity of the IBC is being put to question. There are serious doubts about IBC's future, future capacity to deliver credible elections. The very existence of IBC is in doubt. We have earned the dubious distinction as a country whose electoral body was split into two at a most crucial phase of its undertakings. We cannot therefore afford to approach the sensitive tasks of reconstituting the IBC in a business as usual manner. Do we want to simply aim at scoring political points in this delicate exercise? Or do we want to be the assembly that put Kenya family on the path of credible elections managed by a respected institution that enjoys the support of Kenyans across the political divide? Can't we be the house that solved with finality the problems that deny credibility to this institution that is so critical to political management of our country? As I finish now, I want to refer you to the to St. Paul's letter to Galatians. Just listen to me. St. Paul, in his letter to Galatians, if you go to chapter 3, verse 1, Paul is, uh, Paul is uh, really exhorting the Galatians. Indeed, he is rebuking them. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Yet you know clearly that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And we are going back to the law of Moses. This letter was written, I think, in the first century after Christ. And St. Paul, or Apostle Paul, could as well have been speaking to Kenyans in the 21st century. <laughs> that we know our problems, we know what should be done, and yet we decided to differ on how to do it. Simply to score political points. St. Paul must have been addressing us. With all, with all, with all those very many remarks, uh, thank you, honorable colleagues, and may the Almighty God uh, take care of you. Thank you.